So today we are talking about fall color. Uh, it's mid-October and we are starting to see beautiful colors emerging all over town. Uh, trees are just starting to turn. Uh, some of the bushes are going to start turning very soon as well. So we're going to talk today about how to get some of that color into your own yard, how to care for it, how to get the brightest, best colors out of your plants possible. Uh, this is actually going to be a very simple class. Uh, so we'll just kind of talk about uh, uh, first <coughs> some of the common questions that we get this time of year. First off, when is it too late to plant? I get that one all the time. Actually, there's never really a time when it's too late to plant here, and fall is the very best time to plant uh, any time of, uh, compared to any other time of year. What's going to happen is when we put these plants in the ground now, uh, they'll, they're going dormant. And when they wake up from dormancy in the spring, uh, the leaves come out, they automatically acclimate to the climate that they're in when they, when they unfurl. And so they don't even realize that they've been moved. They just wake up and say, this is where I've always been, right? And they're very happy. You don't have to worry about uh, winter. Uh, everyone's concerned what's going to happen if I have a new plant in the ground when it starts freezing. Don't worry, these trees are very, very hardy. We have trees that are going to spend the winter outside in their growers' pots. All they have is maybe one or two feet uh, of root ball and soil, and that's it. There's no insulation between that root ball and the outside chill. And they're going to make it through the winter that way. The root ball will freeze solid and they're going to be fine. So in the ground, they're even more insulated because they have soil around them. So you don't have to worry about what the freeze is going to do to your new plants. That's okay. Uh, we do encourage you to water during the winter, especially new plants, a couple times a month. We have very dry winters. Our, our winters, they can get pretty chilly. During the Dece uh, month of December, we're usually looking at teens every night. We'll have a, a cold spell at least once a year where it, it drops <coughs> into the single digit, sometimes even below zero. We'll see years once in a while where we see that. And, uh, you know, so it, it's okay. You can actually plant year round. If the root ball is frozen, you'll want to thaw that out in the garage before <laughs> uh, uh, planting it. <coughs> but you can actually plant year round here. Uh, fall just works out so well. These, these plants have all the way up until, what, May, June next year to uh, uh, grow out their roots and get strong before getting hit by that June heat. June is brutal on new plants. It truly is. It's because not only is it hot, but it's also dry. June is a very hot, dry, dry, dry month uh, until those monsoon uh, rains kick in in July, the leaves are transpiring sometimes faster or almost faster than the roots can take up water uh, from their new environment. They're still recovering from the transplant and so it can be very, very hard on new plants. You can still do it, but you really got to watch it, make sure that they always have water. But it, if you've ever tried to, to plant a potentia in June, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it is a hard thing to do. Uh, so when you plant trees, shrubs, perennial flowers uh, of most types in the fall, they have all those months to get stronger and produce a good, strong, well-anchored root ball that will help them get through the summer months. That's really what it's all about. It's all about the roots. So here, uh, um, when you buy a, a tree or a shrub, we do give you a, a planting guide and watering guide at checkout. It's just automatic, it'll be attached to your receipt, it'll be a tri-fold paper. And on one side, it has your warranty information and also your watering guide. It'll tell you how much, how often. It takes all the guesswork out of watering. Uh, you'll, you'll find that here, our climate tends to trick you we have such dry air that it, it, we're feeling ourselves dry out and we feel the plants must need more water. <laughs> Actually, our soil is very clayish, 
does a fabulous job of uh, retaining water. So don't let that trick you. It is slow to absorb. So you want to water very slowly so that the soil has time to absorb all the water it needs. But water for hours at a time. Let that water penetrate nice and deep. And then it will hold water for, in the case of established plants, at least a week, at least. In the case of the new plants, we do say baby them a little bit because they're not quite meshing with their new soil just yet, and so they dry out a little faster. So we do say water twice a week during that first summer. We're going into winter now, so right now, check your, your plants uh, every week to see what they're needing. We're having some warm days, we're having cool days, we're having lots of very cool nights. We've even seen frost a couple of times. But uh, check them every week, but you'll start to get a feel of how often your soil is actually drying out and very soon we'll be transitioning into the part of winter where we're just watering a couple times a month. Good deep soakings and uh, sometimes you'll have to wait until the, the soil dries, uh, thaws out in the winter and then go ahead and give it some water. So the, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> the, uh, the next question that is very common this time of year I mean very common is what is that tree that's turning red all over town it's a red maple which is this one right here this particular variety is autumn blaze uh, one of the most common uh, has brilliant red foliage just so red the leaves have a little bit of translucency when the light hits it just right it almost looks pink because it's so red uh, they are generally the first trees to turn so this is the one that catches everybody's notice right away. Can you, uh, can you see okay? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, the red maple is generally going to turn, uh, start turning red about September fall, uh, September, October, I'm sorry, and eventually grows to about 40 feet, maybe slightly more, about, we'll say 40 to 50 feet. It's a very, very big tree. If that's too big for you, and I know a lot of people, they don't really like huge trees in their yards. There are some varieties of maples that get that brilliant red that grow smaller. We have Tartarian maple, which uh, we have some uh, out front uh, near the topiaries right now. And you can see that they've got their red color. And they only grow at about 20, 25 feet. So much smaller, much more usable in our yards. Yes. I have a picture of one of my phone, but it has really small leaves. Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, this is what it looks like, but um, the leaf broke, but it's just a, it's a, it's a big tree, but it has tiny leaves, but it looks like a maple, but it's a brilliant It tree. does look like a maple. She was asking uh, which tree this is. I would probably have to get a better look at the leaves to, to say which of the maples it is. The red maples, it can be difficult to tell exactly which one it is, because they are very, very closely related. Oh, you do have a picture. You know what that does look like? It's probably autumn place. Autumn place? Yeah. Okay. The autumn place tends it's to have a sort of uh, <coughs> longer fingers compared to some of the other maples. Okay. So you autumn can place. tell them apart. <laughs> what, what's the price of that tree there? What is the price of this tree here? Uh, this particular one is a seven gallon and it's $120 right now. It's probably standing about eight feet it's, tall. What was the number? 120. 120. The nice thing about maples is, is that they're also very fast growing, so you get a beautiful tree very quickly in your yard. That's another uh, plus, especially for those of you that are looking for that privacy screening, <laughs> especially in summer when you're spending more time outside. You kind of like to have a little bit of a block. Is that one going to shed one. all its leaves? Yes, it's going to shed all its leaves soon. You see, they've already turned. But the nice thing about the maple is that it turns the soonest and seems to keep its color longest compared to many of the other trees. Yes? I, I've got two big red uh, maples mm -hmm. in the backyard and I had somebody come in and said, oh, you need to prune your tree because we, you know, it's, it doesn't have a central leader. It kind of split off. Okay. I'm a little nervous. What do you think, it, how would you, do you recommend thinning, pruning, or even touching pruning these trees? Because they're beautiful. They, normally maples don't really need pruning. I mean, if there's, say, a dead branch in there or something, obviously you would take that out. They typically don't need a lot of trimming and pruning, but if it's, say, 
seems rather heavy on one side and you're kind of worried that it's not anchored well, you can have someone come in and take a look at it and maybe just to be safe, uh, trim it up. But I did have someone come in last week that had that problem that her maple was leaning and uh, it was very heavy on one side. All the growth seemed to be on one side and she was worried it was leaning towards the house. It was right next to her house and leaning over it. So she was worried. Usually trees can grow crooked. And as long as they're anchored well, if they're good and healthy and have a good strong root system, they're very well anchored, they can handle some leaning. But there are cases that we've seen that for one reason or another, one was shallow rooted and <coughs> or something went wrong, it, especially if you have gophers or grubs, it can eat away your roots and a huge tree can fall over. We have seen that. So if you're worried, you know, you can have someone come out and take a look and give you a, a better opinion. So uh, the next one, and you're probably wondering what is uh, sitting right next to it. I don't know if you can see it very well. Let me pull this aside. There's an oak, which is in the middle of turning right now. It has it fully. Right now it's a beautiful orangey red. It will actually keep going until it's about fire engine red. And in the leaves, they tend to stay on for a really long time. Uh, this is another question that I get once in a while. Uh, in January, the, the leaves have a tendency to stay on through the winter. And then they start falling off in January. And then people wonder if maybe something is wrong. Maybe those leaves were supposed to stay on and, and come back and, and maybe the tree is dying. No, that's just their normal habit. They'll, they'll shed a, a little on the late side as late even as January. That's just the nature of oaks. That one in particular is a pin oak. Uh, and you can see that one, it will get, uh, that one is another very tall tree, but not fast growing like the maple. So this is one, uh, put it in a place where you have time to let it grow out. It doesn't need to be huge right away. But otherwise, great tree. The nice thing about oaks, very low water users, very drought tolerant. So if you want to yard, that's not going to be taxing your water bill and taking up a lot of time. Oaks are wonderful for that. Uh, we also have some shrubs here that also turn color. We have uh, uh, the barberry, for instance. These actually have color year-round. They come in various colors, orange, red, purple, green, lime green, all sorts of colors, and they also come in different sizes. You have two here uh, that are uh, different types. This one's kind of long and narrow. This one's short and bushy. They turn an even redder color right now. These are purple varieties, you can see, but very soon they'll <coughs> turn this brilliant red color. So you can actually get some more color down uh, closer to the ground and more in eye level, up closer to the house, uh, in small spaces, you can actually get color for fall everywhere. If any of you have been up to Flagstaff, or if you've been in high elevations recently, you probably notice there's a, a big, brilliant red bush, just gorgeous, and you wanted to know what it is. This one right here is a young one, obviously. This is burning bush. I think I had two up here, didn't I? I had a bigger one. Uh, oh, other that. side. Yes. yes. You can see this one is just barely starting to turn. This one hasn't turned yet. These will get very large. Depending on the variety, you could be looking at easily five feet tall uh, and wider. Right for hedges, any place where you need a large bush, and they turn, I mean, as brilliant as a maple. And this one catches everybody's eye. They have some up at the mall. Uh, some people have them in their yards. People come in all the time and say, what is that gorgeous bush that's all red? And this is it. So pretty soon we'll be getting those questions and very soon. What was the name of it again? Burning Bush. Burning, Burning Bush. Burning. Here's a, a really good one. And this one actually, I believe, was just featured as Pack of the Week this week. This is Pyracantha. Now this, this particular variety turns into a very large bush excellent for privacy screening, uh, any place where you want, again, a no-care plant, this one fits the bill. It's evergreen, it has fall color, it actually gets the berries instead of the color of the leaves. It's just covered in berries. Most varieties are orange, 
This one is red, it's called Victory Pyracantha. Turns into a huge bush. Needs practically no water once it's established. You couldn't ask for more with this one. If that's too big though, because they do get large, 10, maybe 12 feet sometimes. This is a smaller variety, only get three or four foot. A nice, well-managed <laughs> bush. Still covered in berries, just like the other varieties. I had someone come in last week. She bought two of these and two green pots and had them potted into them and, and put them on either side of her entryway. She's going to keep them trimmed so that they just keep looking like this. They look gorgeous. They really do. They really look like something. If you have a shade, <coughs> yes, how? Do they need a lot of sun? Yes, they love sun, uh, which is what I was just about to say, because if you don't have a lot of sun, you can go with the holly. Again, bright red berries, but this one is a plant that will survive where none of the other plants seem to make it. Uh, holly can take dimmer conditions than most things, especially large things. It is a slow grower. Anything that can survive in shade generally ends up being a slow grower. It can survive on less light. So the metabolism is lower so that it can survive that way. So they're very slow growing. Keep them in the shade, especially during the heat of the day. Morning sun is fine. Uh, you do need two. You need to have two, uh, one male, one female. What's the name of that plant? Hmm? What's the name this of is that? Holly. Oh, yeah, this one we call Berry Magic, and what's so special about it is that there are two in here. There's a male and a female, and they're kind of growing together so that you can't quite tell which is which. So it all just looks like one female that has lots of berries on it, but there's actually a male hidden in there. If you look down here at the bottom, you can see there are two trunks. <coughs> the male is required to pollinate the female so that it can produce berries. So you do need to have two. If you don't have room for two bushes, either plant them very close together or just get one that already has two in there. So very, very convenient. If you're interested in more evergreens, here's a couple. <coughs> we have Nandina. Nandina always has a little bit of color in it all the time. Uh, the new growth comes out in pinks and reds and purples, and then they mature to green during the summer. But in the fall and winter, they turn color. The whole bush turns color. And it's all pinks, golds, reds, oranges. Uh, the Sienna Sunrise turns mostly red, while the Gulf Stream tends to be more pastel-y. And again, it's evergreen, and depending on the variety you get, uh, they can be anywhere from one and a half feet to six feet, and everywhere in between. So decide which size you want, and just pick out the one that matches. Nandina, also called Heavenly Bamboo. It's not really a bamboo. <laughs> Just looks like one, but it is often called heavenly bamboo. This one right here is a semi-evergreen, which means it has to get really cold for it to lose leaves. Really cold, and it rarely happens. This is a bilia, again, several varieties. You can see that it's covered in blooms and buds here, and it's been blooming for a while. It kind of starts late summer. And the leaves, uh, depending on the variety, will turn colors. Uh, there are variegated versions of this plant, <coughs> which are really sunny looking. I'm just, they're, they're the yellow and green and beautiful, and they still get the flowers. Again, they come in different sizes. Uh, this one is the fairy, which only gets to be a, a few feet tall, but there are versions that get six feet tall, like this, the glossy abelia. Uh, the kaleidoscope abelia is one of the shorter ones, only about two feet, but that's the one, with the, one of the ones that has the variegated leaves. So again, beautiful for fall, beautiful year round, really. And over here I have a Virginia creeper. This is a, if you need a vine and you want it to have fall color, this is the one to go with. This one will turn, again, red. I know red is a very popular color here, so I keep bringing it up. Uh, but this one particular, uh, turns red before defoliating for the winter. Just imagine a wall <coughs> of red, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. What's its name again? Virginia Creeper. Virginia Creeper. Yep. And it will climb 
of just about anything, actually, as long as it's got a fairly rough surface. Uh, they have these little, if you look at their tendrils, you'll notice that they, they sort of fork off. It's almost like a hand that can just grab onto rough surfaces. So they can climb up trees, fences, trellises, rough walls, brick walls. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find a vine that will grow where you want it to go. Some vines will go, only go up walls and others will only go up trellises. This one is pretty happy where you put it. So give it plenty of space and let it go. What I do want to uh, go into is the feeding regimen for these plants, especially since we're talking about reds. Like I said, reds have been so popular these, uh, these days. It is important to feed and acidify in this area, especially when you want fall color. When, uh, the, when the maples turn color, what's actually happening is the green chlorophyll is no longer being produced in the leaf. And when that green disappears, it reveals the red underneath. The red was actually there all year long. If you notice that fall comes and your maple tree does not turn red or doesn't turn as red as it normally does, it just seems to kind of look funny and, and then just turn straight to brown, it means that it had a nutrient deficiency all along but now you're seeing the symptoms. If, if they don't have the nutrients that they need, then that red color won't be there. So that, that tells you that they just didn't get enough food. And that comes up to two things. One is fertilizer. You have to keep up on that fertilizing regimen. Uh, this one, for example, this is the one that I always recommend the most. It was made for our soil, for our area. It wasn't made in the east. For Virginia and North Carolina and all those places over there. It was made for us. We know what our soil is deficient in here. That keeps the nutrient uh, uh, content up so that the tree is healthy. Because it's not just about looks, it's about keeping the tree healthy. It keeps the tree healthy and keeps it looking pretty, especially when fall rolls around. The, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this one you want to use about four times a year in most cases. You'll, you'll talk about uh, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. Just remember once per season. Very easy. This is really easy to apply. It's just made of natural stuff. When you open it, you won't see the granulated, crystallized, synthetic goodness knows what that you're used to seeing. When you, when you open this up, it just looks like a menagerie of different types of dirt or something. It's actually uh, a composted bird guano and cottonseed meal and you know stuff that actually would come off of a farm and you take this stuff and you just kind of toss it like chicken scratch around the tree. This will keep the new, uh, the, the keep feeding the plant as it needs it especially when we get into those summer and fall months these are very very important because first monsoon comes in we get excess water it leaches all the nutrients out of the ground it starts causing plants to uh, deplete their nutrients faster in their leaves. You start seeing funny colors like yellow. Uh, so you see that, that from all that excess water that we're getting from all that rain. So it's important to feed during that time and then in fall, you don't want to see that depletion in your fall color. And then in fall, it's also important to feed because then the plant can spend the winter taking up nutrients because come spring, it's going to have to grow out all new leaves. And that's going to take a lot of energy. So it's very important to keep up on that feeding regimen. Yes? Um, when you spread that food, do you have to water it in good after you spread it or do you just spread it in this? The question is, uh, do you need to water right after feeding? It kind of depends. I usually don't worry about it. Uh, typically we're on a regular watering regimen anyway it's sooner or later it'll get watered in some people do like to do it if uh, they have dogs that tend to come and lick it up later uh, or if for some reason it it's going to be a long time before that uh, uh, plant gets watered if it's a low water plant then yeah you can go ahead and water it certainly never hurts to water it in but like if you have a lot of dogs like our dogs water, 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 
Yeah, that would be a good idea. If you have mm. a gravel or rock and you're having to put it on top of that, then yeah, water it so it can push into into the rock. Once it's down where the irrigation can wet it, then it'll take over from there. This is a three month release, okay. approximately. I've only seen very, very rare cases where someone had an area filled in with, say, disintegrated granite, mm -hmm. and it doesn't hold nutrients well. And then you say, okay, maybe five, six times a year might be a good idea. It's not prone to burning, so you can adjust it that way, budget a little bit. But for most of us, we are talking about clayish soil. Even when we have sand, which some of us do here at Prescott, it's actually a mixture of sand and clay. It's not really as sandy as it looks. So go ahead, use that four times a year. And if you're really good about keeping that up, it will keep your plants very healthy. That and one more thing, and that's the sulfur. We have a very high alkaline level here in our soil and also in our water. Uh, the soils around here usually test around eight, sometimes even nine. We've actually seen as high as 10 <laughs> uh, in one case. It was, it was practically sterile. When the, uh, uh, when the soil is too alkaline, it prevents plants roots from being able to take up nutrients. So the nutrients may be there, but they're just not able to access it. And the plant starves even though there's food there. So that's where you uh, bring in sulfur. If you treat with sulfur every year, especially if you haven't ever done it, it's a really good idea to do it because that pH is out of this world, I, I promise you. And it's, it, every time you water, it goes up again because the water has a pH of about 9.0. So if you use sulfur every year, that will help these uh, trees and plants take up their nutrients. Maples are especially sensitive to alkalinity. So these especially, you have to keep up with your sulfur treatment. Sulfur can be used any time of the year. A lot of people like to make it part of their spring regimen. So that's really up to you, but it can be used any time. Yes? Well, I use silver every year, about a cup, let's just say a red tip potinia. Okay. One cup. And I was surprised the recommendation is, you know, do it every year. Mm -hmm. And then when I still dig in, because that silver is yellow, you can see it in the soil. But does it really disintegrate <coughs> every year and you keep adding? Or I kind of worry I might be overdoing it. If you're still seeing it in the soil, you might want to bring some in for us to take a look at and uh, you might even test it and see what's going on. Usually, it, it should dissolve and, and be... But every year. In, in norm, yeah. Under normal circumstances, yes, you would need it every year. And yes. I know that your stuff that they sell here does have sulfur in it, which is good. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. fertilizer here does have a little bit of sulfur. It, and also we use some acidic ingredients like cottonseed meal. What that does is it makes the food itself acidic. That really helps to, um, even better than having the uh, more acidic soil, if the food itself is actually acidic, that makes it even more readily available to the roots. So there are some nutrients in our soil that are permanently locked. There are, there's actually iron and calcium in our soil, and yet we're always seeing signs of iron and calcium deficiency. They're just locked up by that alkalinity. So it does help if the nutrients themselves have been acidified. Let's see. Uh, what else do we want to go over? Flowers, color. So we want to kind of show you how, how much is blooming. <coughs> during this time of year. And you can see there's a, still a very large variety. Uh, the mums, of course, look incredible. This one here, right here. We do sell smaller ones, but you can see, given time, especially if you have a few of them planted together, but given time, they, they grow into this amazing mound. The, main, the great thing about mums is that when they bloom, there's no space in between the flowers, none. <laughs> so, we had someone come in and buy six of these for their wedding uh, just uh, about two weeks ago, and, and you can see why. So these moms say fall; they just do. You can't you can't have a fall without moms. How long did the bloom last on that plant? 
Let's see, how long has this one been? It's been blooming for weeks. It, yeah, I, I think it's, we got that three weeks ago. Yeah. About three weeks ago. <coughs> But if there's still buds in there too. Some of these flowers, I can see they're, they're going to fade soon, but there's buds underneath them. So if you deadhead, if, if, if you see the flowers are starting to look kind of brown and they, they look like they're ready to go, go ahead and take those out. And uh, there's buds underneath. It will keep blooming until we get into heavy frost. Usually about end of October at the earliest. Yes? When we were talking about the Will you be mentioning how long they'll bloom so that we know which ones we can get the most longevity out of? Yeah, if you want something, especially if you're planting early in the season, get one that is mostly buds or half open flowers, and that way you, you get that longevity. But again, the buds never really stop forming, so you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, basically, if you have a party coming up this weekend and you, know, you want it to look perfect, and go ahead. But as I said, this has been blooming since September. And it still looks pristine. Yeah. It looks gorgeous and it's not done. There, if you look in here, you can see a lot of buds oh, yeah. under those flowers. And so basically it'll just keep producing buds. It won't stop. And then you'll get hit by heavy frost and that's when the plant says, oh, okay, I'm done. And then the, the buds that haven't opened yet will just dry up on the plant. So it doesn't actually stop until it's forced to. So don't worry too much about longevity with mums. What's the price of that big yellow? This one, I believe, is around forty. Yeah, thirty-nine ninety-nine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thirty-nine ninety-nine, <coughs> so forty. Okay. Right now, snapdragons and dianthus are in full bloom. Actually, my snapdragons bloomed almost nonstop this year. They kind of took a little break in the summer. It did get hot, but normally they bloom in spring and fall. And they're biennial, biennials. Both of these are biennials, which means they live for two years and then just die automatically, not because of weather or anything. They just die automatically. Uh, but the snapdragons are really great about dropping seeds. So you'll see them a lot of times come back year after year. I've had people think that they were perennial. And no, you're just seeing them come back from seed. So these, uh, both of these will last for a couple of years, put them in sunny locations, they need very little water. It's very easy to kill these, especially the dianthus. Very easy to kill them with too much water. So be careful with that. Very easy care. Snapdragons especially are practically wildflowers. As I said, I've, I've seen many places where people just don't even care for them. I don't care for mine. Yeah, I've got some snapdragons here. This, these came in, started coming in last year. I have a sunset color, isn't that gorgeous? These are absolutely gorgeous and perfect for fall. There's just something about that that says you have to take them home. <laughs> <laughs> the dusty miller, we call this an annual. It's an accent plant. We call this an annual. We have seen them in sheltered areas go through a few winters, so they're kind of borderline for us. These are, the, uh, are often used as accent plants. We have a kale here or cabbage. The kales and cabbages are very cold tolerant. If you've ever uh, left something unharvested in your vegetable garden, you notice some of those things actually withstand heavy freezing without a problem. Well, these are ornamental kales and cabbages. I've got another one up here. They come in different colors, purples, greens. Some have pink or white centers. And when you combine these with the flowers, it just sets it off. It finishes the whole thing. The flowers provide a lot of color, but when you have this perfect rosette, on the side, it's just the finishing touch you need on your on your plants, on your especially potted plants. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Patty once told me that the most beautiful arrangement she'd ever seen, and you know she's been gardening longer than any of us, right? The most beautiful flower arrangement she'd ever seen was a big purple cabbage, full grown, big, gorgeous, with a backdrop of Dusty Miller. That's all it was. She said it was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. The ivies, of course, they could be your trailers. And these are evergreen. They do go all the way through winter. Um, the English ivy does prefer some, uh, some shade. The vika is a little more versatile as long as it's not really, really hot. 
So here we have pansies, and I, I really want to make sure I mention these because they're not just fall bloomers, they're also winter bloomers. Mm -hmm. Pansies will actually start blooming in fall, keep blooming through the winter. Sometimes, depending on the winter, they might take a break, but most of the time they'll just bloom all the way through. And they keep blooming through spring, and then when they really live up to their name pansy, it's when the summer heat kicks in. That's when they, they turn into pansies. <laughs> so, but they, they don't mind freezing, they, I, they can freeze solid and survive and it's no problem at all. The only time I've seen pansies die in the winter is when the soil stays frozen, especially if they're in the shade where the sun never hits. They'll stay frozen day and night, week after week, and finally they die of dehydration. Can't take water up from frozen soil. Come in so many different colors and these are the ruffled ones. We've featured these as plant of the week a few times because they're so pretty. So these are, yeah. So I brought up brought up those. I love these. I, I planted these last fall and they bloomed like there was no tomorrow without stopping the entire winter. No kidding, it was gorgeous. So, uh, any questions? Did I miss anything? Oh, yeah, I couldn't help it. I had to bring up the fall vegetables. Well, there's a lot more than these, of course, but I brought up the ones that are fall colors. We've actually made flower bowls with these before. Take a pot, put in some fall color flowers and some vegetables together. It looks pretty and it's edible. Put it by your front door and you can open the door and, and pick some fresh veggies for your dinner or your breakfast anytime that you want. You can see I, I've got beets here, I've got chard and, and some different lettuces. And so you can see, you have, and these will actually go through the entire fall and some types of vegetables will go through the winter, but they won't grow much. And you can just keep harvesting. You take off the leaves, eat them, and, and they grow right back. And so you get to a continual harvest off of those. Oh, I almost forgot grasses. The grasses are also uh, in feather right now. So I did bring up some grasses for you to, to see. They come in all sizes and types. Another common question that I get, what is this? <laughs> this is pompous grass. Uh, generally, these plumes will stay on through the winter, actually, and then you can cut them in, in January when they're looking kind of icky from being snowed on so many times. Um, the one, uh, normally you see the regular pompous grass, but the ones they, with the really big thick plume, like the ones we have out by our gate, that's uh, ivory feathers. So that's what you're looking at. Okay, any, any questions? Did we cover everything? All right then. So, uh